Thank you. All right, and here we go. My name is John Hubbard, and I'm an instructor for SANS and course author. And one of the courses that I just finished writing out uh, is a new class on Blue Team Fundamentals. And it's geared toward Tier 1 analysts. And so with that, uh, of course, I was doing a whole bunch of research on the topic and working through processes and procedures and best practice for SOX. And running through that, and having been through that myself, I've been a tier one analyst and a senior analyst and a SOC manager and had all those kind of perspectives on my own. Uh, I kept running into and talking to people that had the same problems as me. And I didn't really go out looking for solving this problem necessarily from the start. But by the time I was done reading a bunch of stuff and writing the class, I think I had stumbled on some interesting research and, and come up with some interesting uh, mental models for how a SOC could be run. And was having a hard time escaping the conclusion that what we are doing with the traditional tiered SOC may not benefit us like it had in the past, given the new tools and things that we can do and the new research that we have on the topic. So uh, from that, this presentation was born. And so I hope to uh, stoke some thinking and give you guys some uh, stuff to talk about maybe tonight. Uh, with the uh, ideas that I'm going to present here, I'd love to have a conversation with anyone here that's a manager or analyst. Uh, with that, how many people here are SOC managers or directors, uh, CISOs, anything like that? And how many analysts do we have in the room? So quite a few of both. So I'd love to talk to you all later on. I'll be at the event later uh, if you have any comments or uh, you know, reactions to this. All right, so real quick, uh, quantifying the problem. We all know that there is a cybersecurity gap. Uh, the ISC squared workforce study from last year found that this is about 3 million people, and it is having a serious impact. 59% of organizations say that they are at either extreme or moderate risk due to their staff shortage. So this is no joke, right? This is actually, at least perceptibly, causing a problem for us. And since 50% roughly of teams are going to be hiring, uh, we can obviously say that it's important to not only uh, hire good people and find them, it's very difficult to do, but we also need to keep them once we find them because this gap is going to keep perpetuating. Uh, out until at least 2023, we're going to continue to have this problem, and the gap is only going to diverge from where it is right now, and it's going to get worse. So, we need to do something about that. Here's the problem. According to an HP study on security operations centers, the average SOC analyst is only in the job for one to three years. That doesn't seem long enough to me. Uh, if I was going to go through school and learn something as difficult as uh, being a security analyst or come about it anyway, right? Uh, it's not something you probably want to only put one to three years into. And so there are multiple reasons for that, and we're going to touch on those. I went looking for how people describe SOC jobs, and I went to Reddit, and I went to the Ask NetSec section, and you can just type in the word SOC and look at some of the comments for how people describe their SOC jobs, especially Tier 1. Uh, this is the one that I'm going to harp on most for this particular talk. So people say things like drowning in tickets, right? Uh, your IP was scanned, uh, something that was a C2 10 years ago, something's probably infected. Sound familiar, right? Uh, that's stuff that we see over and over. People feel like they're doing repetitive work. Uh, you know, they, under or they overestimate how much they're going to learn until ultimately they realize they're just arbitrarily sifting through data to generate metrics. This sounds really, really bad, right? We don't want our employees saying stuff like this, but this may be actual comments from people that work in our organization, right? These are real comments on this job. Uh, tier 1 SOC work is really boring. My goal is to try to make it so no one makes these comments anymore, because I think this can be a very exciting job if we do it right and if we organize it right. And given the tools that are coming out now, uh, like some of the things we see from the vendors out here, I don't think it has to be like this anymore. But we have to understand what causes it to be like this in the first place. Burnout. Can we understand what causes burnout? Uh, what are the symptoms of it? We've all probably seen this in people at work, right? Uh, diminished interest and exhaustion and cynicism. People just feel like they're phoning it in, and they're just showing up, going through the motions, trying to get to the weekend, and they're just like, they don't want to be there, right? They can go through the work, but they don't want to excel. They don't want to learn anything new. There are some causes for that. We know what it looks like, but we don't necessarily have great uh, research into the, or we haven't at least, had great research into the causes of it, in a SOC position specifically. If we can understand what causes burnout in a SOC, we can get ahead of it, of course, and we can prevent this from happening. And if we can prevent this from happening, we're going to keep people in their jobs, which makes life easier for us as SOC managers, 
It makes life more happy for people who are analysts, and it makes security better for the organization. So everyone wins, right, if we can figure this problem out. Uh, everything gets better. So what we are looking for is teams that are intrinsically motivated, people that are happy, they're engaged, they want to come to work, and they enjoy what they do, right? This is a difficult thing to cultivate. Uh, we have to look at what causes this sort of thing, especially in this type of work, uh, in knowledge workers specifically. How do we keep people motivated who are doing a job that is not just doing the same thing over and over all day, but is actually solving very, very difficult challenges that are new and requires constant learning? We have to get people motivated to do this. And one of the typical approaches, of course, is money. But uh, we've all probably got a raise at some point in our life, and it felt great at the moment, but then three weeks later, how do you feel about the raise? It's just the new way, right? And you're like, all right, well, that was cool for a little bit. Maybe I bought a little nicer car, but now, ultimately, I'm still doing the same job, and I don't like it. It, don't, it doesn't change what you did. It just made it a little more tolerable for a little bit. And so there's been research on this. Uh, Daniel Pink wrote a book called Drive a few years ago, and it was about this problem. How do we motivate people that are in these types of positions to get work done and to stay uh, enthusiastic about what they're doing? And he went through the research and found the same thing. It's kind of counterintuitive, but money actually can make things worse for tasks like this. It actually does work for basic mechanical algorithmic tasks. If you want to do an if-then kind of, you know, if you do this job faster, then I'll give you more money motivator, research shows that that does work for those types of tasks. But when it comes to more difficult work, it doesn't necessarily help, and it can actually hurt. So not a good tool for engagement or keeping people enthusiastic. Uh, we need to do something better. We need to cultivate intrinsic motivation. And so what does motivate people? That was the point of this book. And so I want to touch on these things as a high level that is not SOC specific before we dive into the SOC specific stuff, just to show you how the two things line up. Uh, three factors that he found. And we can use these to help guide uh, the stuff that I'm going to talk about in specific for a SOC in a moment. One of those guiding principles of the three is autonomy, the desire to be self-directed. We can all probably relate to this, right? A lot of what I'm going to say in this may be like, yeah, that makes total sense, right? But maybe you didn't have the words for it. I think the value here is presenting a model for how to uh, pick a guide for what you're going to be doing in your SOC. So one of them, of course, Autonomy. People like being self-directed. They like being able to choose what they're going to do and make decisions that are going to affect their own life, right? That makes sense. Another one, mastery. So the drive to become better at something. Why do people go home and practice instruments, or why do they go, you know, program the Linux kernel for free, write Wikipedia articles, all this kind of stuff, right? Uh, they want to get better at something, and it gives them a sense of accomplishment. And so mastery is another high-level guiding principle that can help people stay engaged. We want to provide them an outlet for them to feel like they're getting better at something. And then purpose. Purpose is another one. The yearning to do something in service of something greater than ourselves. This can be at a big level, like do you agree with what your company is doing? Or it can be on a micro level, is do you think that your SOC is actually making a difference? If the analysts don't feel like they're actually providing any additional security, do you think they're going to be enthusiastic about the work? No, of course not. There's no purpose in doing work that doesn't provide any better security, so they're not going to enjoy it. Now, those are the three things from the book Drive. I'm going to bring this down more specifically to SOC. Uh, does this translate? I believe that it does. And so I went looking for more specific information that can line up against this for uh, analysts. And I found uh, a single research paper about this that was actually uh, very closely aligned to these ideals. So it's called A Human Capital Model for Mitigating Security Analyst Burnout. And this is a uh, paper where they went out looking for how to maintain a capable and enthusiastic workforce. Unfortunately, that was cut off a little bit there. But uh, I can tweet out the link after this for the paper. Great read for if you're a manager or analyst or otherwise. Now, human capital. This is an idea that came from Adam Smith from The Wealth of Nations, but the idea is basically the human capital of a nation or of a SOC is the sum total of all these skills and the knowledge and the capabilities of the people that make up that group. And so for a SOC, there are certain things that you want to cultivate to up your human capital. And those are the things that will also keep people from being burnt out. So what are those things? This is one of the key items here. They went looking and put someone in a SOC for six months, a researcher into a SOC. They became a SOC analyst. They 
learned how to do all the procedures, they gained the trust of everyone in the SOC, they gained an empathetic position for what was going on day to day. And they took observations. And they said they took like 85 different pages of notes that they had to code independently. And they came up with these four things as the core uh, category for what they found. This is one category of four things. But these are the four kind of subcomponents of that thing. Growth, skills, empowerment, and creativity. These four items, if nothing else from this talk, are the four things you need to remember to cultivate enthusiastic, engaged workforces in your SOC, or really anywhere, right? So I'll go to these in specific. Skills. This is the skills to do your job. Are you getting training? Security changes all the time. So if you're not getting training, you're going to fall behind. You're not going to know how to triage and work tickets or alerts that are maybe for a new attack. It's going to lead to frustration. And frustration is going to lead to burnout. And then burnout leads to people quitting, right? So we need to keep people trained up and make sure they have the skills to do the job. Oh, the other thing about that cycle, it's a positive feedback loop. As one thing goes up or down, the next thing goes up or down. That's important in this. The next one is empowerment. Are you empowered to look at the data, to take the actions needed to actually make a difference and efficiently do the job? We need to have the skills to do the job. And if the skills are there, then management will trust us with the power to take action or to see data to actually deal with this stuff. But if you don't have skills, then you're not going to be empowered to do the job, which is ultimately going to lead to this uh, vicious cycle, right, of the human capital model. The next thing, creativity. If your analysts are bound by playbooks and they can only follow a path on rails and do exactly what they've been pre-prescribed to do, they are not being able to be creative and they're going to not like their job. If they're not empowered to do things, they can't be creative. Uh, and they're, you know, of course, not going to have a good time, and things are going to go downhill from there. So empowerment leads to creativity. This is creativity to take on new tasks and novel situations in a way that you haven't anticipated in the past or seen in the past. But if you say, you know, this is, these are the things that you can do, you're not empowered, they also can't be creative. That's how those link. If you can be creative, then you can come up with these new solutions. You can try new technology. You can program your own tools. And that leads to growth. So growth as in intellectual capacity of the analyst to do more difficult things over time. If you are being creative, you're inherently going to grow. That is the link here. And we want our people to grow. And when they're growing, they're obviously developing more skills. And that kind of completes the cycle, right? So those are the four main kind of subcomponents of the human capital model, which is the core category of what these researchers found was at the heart of the burnout problem. For you, what this means is if you can cultivate these four things and align all your processes and what people are allowed and capable of doing, then you're more likely to not have an issue with burnout. But it's more than that. There are additional factors. That's just the one cycle. There are multiple cycles here, which is why the talk is called Virtuous Cycles. Uh, to mitigate analyst burnout, SOCs have to pay special attention to the interaction of human capital with three other factors. And so those three factors form their own loops. That first loop is the human capital loop. These other ones are a whole different kind of issue that you have to pay attention to. The first one, and a tool we've all now heard a lot about in the recent years. Hot ticket item, right? Automation. Automation is the key component that I think is going to enable us to change how SOCs are structured and perhaps avoid this burnout problem. Automation, getting rid of repetitive tasks. We all know that no one likes doing repetitive tasks, right? But every SOC has those tasks. Why do they have those tasks? Maybe because they haven't had time, maybe because they haven't got the skill. Well, now we have tools, SOAR tools, right, that lower the bar, that allow us to enable automation in a lot easier way than we could do in the past. Maybe in the past we had to know how to use Python to automate stuff. Now we can drag boxes onto a screen and connect them with arrows, right? We have lowered the bar for automation, so this is going to be a transformative technology, and it already is, right? Uh, but it's coming and it's becoming more and more popular. The thing about automation is you need to provide time for reflection to do this, right? Have you ever heard someone say like, oh, if I could just get some free time, I could automate this thing. Well, okay, then your priorities sound like they're misaligned, right? If you have one thing that you can do that will eliminate weeks, hours, years of work, but you're not doing it because you're doing micro tasks that just pop up constantly, are you really doing the right thing with the highest priority? And so the researchers said you have to provide time for reflection to find operations bottlenecks and find where you can actually improve stuff. 
So this is a key component of actually getting automation right, is saying to your analysts, uh, here, you can have some free time to think about what would make your job better. When they do that, then that is bringing up the second factor, which is operational efficiency. Operational efficiency ties into automation, obviously, because when automation comes in, your operational efficiency gets better. But not even through automation, just having people that are going through that cycle, hopefully virtuous cycle, right, of growth and skills and empowerment and creativity, they're inherently going to be more efficient. They're going to do things better, they're going to be more capable. And so operations will become more efficient in that way as well, just directly feeding this. The other thing is metrics, and this is a really big one. Operational efficiency feeds metrics. And metrics are the communication channel between the SOC and management. And this one is incredibly important because management's perception of the SOC needs to be high. They need to understand that they are getting an ROI for the extreme amount of money that they're going to be spending on the SOC. It's not a cheap thing to do. But the idea is it's better than the alternative, which is not having security and having a bunch of expensive breaches. But if you're not proving that, then you're going to fail and management is going to potentially outsource the SOC to someone else because you failed to communicate that. So metrics drive the perception of management of the SOC and assuming it's a good perception, then funding flows back into the SOC, which then ups the ability to do more training and is upping the skills and feeding the cycle in a virtuous way. If you have the wrong metrics, then management doesn't know what you're doing, they don't know what they're paying for, and then the training goes down, the skills go down, and you get stuck in a vicious cycle. So it's a feedback loop, right? This is the biggest feedback loop, all the way through automation, operational efficiency, metrics, going to management, feeding back to that first circle that I showed you. So this is the whole model as it's presented in the paper. I modified it a little bit to fit on the screen. But we have the human uh, capital model on the bottom left there with those four items and how each of those directly feed uh, the next piece. So that whole circle, we need to have time for reflection and that will feed the ability to do automation. Automation removes repetitiveness from the job, which everyone hates, right? That improves operational efficiency. Now this is not meant to connect directly to skills. That's just pointing to the whole arrow. I mean the whole circle. This whole thing, right? Good uh, uh, virtuous cycles are going to feed better operational efficiency. More automation is going to feed better operational efficiency. And both of those are going to produce better metrics, assuming you are collecting the right metrics, which are going to be the input to management. And hopefully management's outcome is like, well, we're definitely getting what we pay for. They're doing a great job. Here's more funding to do a better job, right? And that's the feedback loop back into the SOC, uh, into that cycle. So this is the whole thing. And all of these are kind of independent positive feedback loops. We have the miniature one of the human capital model of those four items, and then we have the loop that goes through the technology. So the human capital loop through automation, operational efficiency, that's kind of driven by do we have automation and what technology do we have? And then ultimately another positive feedback loop going through metrics and management. And all three of these loops, you need to make sure all of these things are on the upswing because they all feed the next thing to go in the same direction as the one before it. And so this is the most important thing and this is kind of the whole highlight of this talk, right? Now, thinking about this, where does this take us? What type of SOC do you run? And do you optimize or do you promote these values in your SOC? Think about this, right? And before you answer, I have a couple scenarios that I heard from a whole lot of analysts that I talked to and a whole lot of things that I've seen online and a whole lot of common scenarios here. Your analysts, you have playbooks, right? And they probably follow those playbooks. And that's a good thing, most of the time, unless you have overdefined your playbooks. Have you ever heard an analyst say, I don't know what to do, the playbook doesn't cover this? You may have an issue with empowerment and creativity if you've heard such a thing, right? <clears throat> and maybe you need to pay more attention to those factors. What about trust? Are analysts trusted with the data they need to do their job? I can tell you, I had an example of this. When I first started many, many years ago doing this, we had a situation where I was not allowed to look at proxy logs without explicit permission. But I was also responsible for triaging alerts. How am I supposed to figure out what happened without being able to see the logs for what happened without asking for permission every single time? That was a bad situation, right? And there was a trust issue there, and that needed to get fixed, and ultimately it was. But things like that can pop up, right? And get in the way and really grind down on people. Uh, can people take swift action? Can they block uh, websites or DNS uh, you know, entries or really anything that is you know, 
quick, swift action to contain an incident? Are they trusted to do that, right? Or do they have to jump through a bunch of hoops before they can actually make a positive influence? Can they see the data they need to investigate? Are your processes overly manual? Have you ever watched an analyst go through taking an alert that's fired, turning it into a case, working through the case, and then writing up the descriptions and closing it? Have you looked for any sort of manual data entry? Things that people are not adding value doing as people. If you have something that's part of the task that there's no reason to have a human do, that is the case for automation. And we now have those tools, and we have the ability to link all that stuff together. So people should not be doing what there is not value in having people doing, right? <clears throat> what about skills and training and practice? Have you ever had live fire type practice, such as a purple team or red team type thing? Do analysts know what it actually looks like when an attack lands on your infrastructure? And are you sure of that? Are your detections working? And have you tested that? How often are your analysts getting training? Do you give it to them once a year, once every five years, once every time you roll the dice and it happens to roll you know, the right number? Who trains your most advanced people? This is a big one. We all have a most advanced analyst, at least in each category, right? Everyone wants to have a role model and look up and have a way to grow. But if they've reached the top in your organization, they're going to be looking for someone else and it's probably going to be outside. So if you can't provide someone in-house that can train someone, you might want to start to look for outside training for those best people on your team because you don't want them to get bored and leave, right? And if they find the ceiling, they might be considering doing that. Do analysts get free time for new ideas and tools? Can they take time off of tickets to actually develop stuff? This is a big important one, right? This is the time for reflection and the time to actually write those tools, which if they can get it, that is another creative outlet for them. This is a huge benefit for them, right? And then if they do have the time, is it undistracted time? Can they get into that deep work kind of flow state? Or are they having to cut with meetings uh, every hour and people trying to talk to them and bothering them at their desk, right? That's a whole different conversation, but consider that one as well. And then another critical question that ties into this. Uh, unfortunately, it's cut off a little bit. It says, how does tier one feel? Tier one, right? This is where I started looking at this paper and thinking, this seems to be fundamentally at odds with how we structure the typical SOC or at least the traditional three-tier or two-tier or whatever you call it SOC, where you say, tier one does this one thing and they triage and they pass it on, but that's all they can do. And they can't maybe see all the data, they can't use all the tools. And I've heard a lot of frustration from people that work in SOCs like that. And so the question that I want to propose mostly from this talk is, how does your tier one feel? Are they feeling like they're on the ground floor looking up through a glass ceiling, that they can't understand why it's there? That is a problem. Your tier one should feel like they're on a rocket ship of learning, taking off, just being flooded with new information and new challenges. Not more than they can handle, but they should feel challenged, right? And often it's those tier one people that quickly find that ceiling and then they get bored and they leave. And that's why I've heard SOC jobs called a revolving door and other sorts of things like that before. That's what we want to prevent. And so that's where I think we have to start reconsidering what a three tier SOC, or if we even want tiers in a SOC anymore, uh, with the tools that we have available, is that the right thing to be doing? So with that, here's my recommendations based on this model and based on my experience. For one, skill improvement. We need to focus on getting a diverse set of training and do it frequently. One of my favorite types of training is purple team training. And by that, what I mean is having pen testers or whoever's doing the attack sitting at the same table as the blue team saying, I'm launching this attack right now. And having them say, okay, here's my sim. I see it. This is what it looks like on your real infrastructure. That's a great training tool, right? And you can see what's actually happening. The quote that goes with this, train like you fight. If you are looking at your actual infrastructure with actual attacks, you're going to get good value and good training out of that. Lack of training, if you don't do it otherwise, becomes lack of confidence, which becomes frustration, and then people leave. Empowerment, let analysts challenge themselves. This is the tier one problem, right? People are capable of more, but we have arbitrarily in some times said, uh, at some times said, well, you are to stop here and you have to pass that on. We should be telling people to challenge themselves and we should say, know your limits, but we want you to constantly learn, right? And we're going to give you the ability to actually resolve these issues when they show up. Uh, we don't want to put arbitrary limits on them because that is what quickly frustrates people it stops their skills and their growth, and it leads to a vicious cycle. Autonomy, however, leads to engagement, right? It feeds this in a good way. Creativity, uh, giving time for reflection and doing things, new tools, the stuff that's truly important. 
I heard the Getting Things Done book reference uh, today. That's a great book. Another one that I think goes really well with that is called The One Thing. And they mentioned this, another four box method called the Eisenhower matrix, which is basically a matrix of things that are urgent or important, and things that are urgent and important, not urgent but important, urgent but not important, and then neither of those things, right? In my opinion, every individual alert probably falls under the urgent but not as important kind of category. Whereas doing automation and making things better that will carry on through the rest of time, that falls into the not urgent but actually important box. But we tend to ignore that stuff because it feels like we have to do tickets right now all the time always. What we should be doing is providing the time for people to do the stuff from box number two in the Eisenhower matrix. You can easily Google that. And the stuff that is important but not necessarily urgent, right? And because it's not urgent, we don't feel like we should do it. But we should be doing it because it actually will prevent uh, all sorts of pain and, and horrible things in the future. So give people the time to do that type of work and excuse them from the whirlwind of alerts and constant triage of stuff that has to happen. Growth. When it comes to growth, we need to right-size this for people. Goldilocks tasks, as this, as this is often called. We don't want to bore them with things that are too easy to do. Uh, but we also don't want to freak them out and cause a bunch of anxiety and frustration by giving them tasks that are too hard. So to do this, you need to have meetings with your people and say, where are you comfortable in terms of alerts and difficulty, right? And put them right in the middle, just at the peak of what they can handle, but not beyond it, because that will scare them and drive them away as well. We have to find just the right balance there. Automation, SOAR tools, right? This is going to play a key part in helping us out here, because one of the key things we need to do is eliminate repetitiveness, and that's what ups creativity. So SOAR tools excuse us from having to do repetitive tasks. We just need the time to come up with the ability to do it. So eliminate those repetitive tasks like the plague and give people the time to do it. It will pay off in retention in the long term, right? <clears throat> and of course, even better, have your analysts do it. Then we have metrics. For metrics, do you have analyst buy-in? I've heard a lot of times analysts say, we are measured by something unfairly. And because of that, they start to do things for the metrics and are not doing what actually is important for security. That is a situation you don't want to be in. Do those metrics demonstrate the SOC return on investment? Very key item there, right? That's the thing that will ultimately feed management, and management feeds the funding, which feeds the human capital model. Are they reflective of analyst effort? Can, even if your analysts are doing something, right? If they're triaging an alert, and they ultimately spend an hour on it, but they find it's a false positive, was that wasted work? No, because you had to do the work, and there is effort there. It just didn't turn out to be something. Right? And it's a good thing you weren't being hacked, but it's effort that needs to be tracked and demonstrated through metrics, right? So uh, we have to watch out for those things. Uh, and then are we pulling the right levers to change our metrics, right? Every once in a while, we come up with those metrics that say we need more people. Well, do we really need more people, or do we need better controls in the first place? What is the root of the problem if we're drowning in alerts? Is the root of the problem that we don't have enough people, or is it that we're letting too many spam emails in and we're not patching correctly and all that stuff? Uh, consider with each metric, what is the actual root problem with that number, and how do we control that instead of put a Band-Aid on it by having more people to react to the problem? If we can react to the true problem, then we can actually solve things the correct way instead of just uh, treating the symptoms, right? So that's the idea with the metrics. <clears throat> and then finally, and probably the most important one, uh, run a human-first SOC, and by that, what I mean is optimize for people being happy, people learning, people enjoying the job. This is the one that's probably the hardest to sell, right? Because you can say, well, okay, we're promoting maybe a tierless SOC at this point, and we're saying, let people do what they're capable of doing and don't cap them. Is that going to lead to chaos? It might lead to chaos, but not necessarily. It doesn't have to. If everyone is mature about it, knows what they're uh, capable of doing and can ask someone next to them because they trust them and it's a well-functioning team, uh, they can have those people help out and teach them how to do that thing, which keeps them growing, which keeps them uh, getting more skills and it ultimately will empower them and put them in a more creative position, right? So with this, uh, the overall idea is this. We have tiered socks, and by that I mean ones that have a traditional kind of limit on what each tier can do. And then we have the tierless model, or at least the model where people are not limited. And that is where I think this research ultimately leads to. If we want to build a SOC that is not going to be burdened by a whole bunch of burnout, we may have to align more with these ideals and unleash our analysts to do what it is that they're interested in doing, give them some more autonomy, 
allow them to build mastery, and uh, of course, with a sense of purpose as well, assuming we're doing that well. So, uh, I would love to hear everyone's feedback on this one, uh, because obviously this is kind of a, a big shift, right? We've had the three-tier SOC model for a long time, and I think with this, uh, I've seen plenty of examples of this online. There's, there's one that I just saw earlier today when I checked SOC on Reddit. Uh, they said, you know, oh, not every SOC has to be like this. You know, my SOC I run in this way where people can learn and do whatever. And the first immediate comment was, where do you work? I want to come work for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it is really easy to sell these kinds of jobs, right? I can sit up here and say it all you want, but of course we can all imagine, right, that those people are out there and it's pretty uh, compelling if we can say, hey, you're going to come to this job and we're going to let you learn and we're going to focus on you enjoying it. We're going to give you some autonomy to do things that are going to help you. Uh, that is obviously a nicer sounding place to work. So uh, that's kind of my proposal on this. And I think going forward into the future, given the ability uh, with this model and the ability to do automation, I think moving towards a... Uh, less restricted by role uh, SOC model in terms of employee uh, positions and, and locations and what they're doing is going to ultimately feed stuff. So what is truly better, right? Yes, we can run a strictly tiered SOC with very strict playbooks, and yes, we're going to have a very, very repeatable process. Things are going to be great in that respect, but we're going to have maybe too much control, and it can lead to burnout and it can lead to people leaving, which ultimately no one gains real institutional knowledge if they're leaving after one to three years. And that's going to maybe sound good in the short term, but hurt us in the long term. Versus a team that you keep around, you keep happy, you let loose on the reins a little bit, but they actually enjoy the job, they stay there for a lifetime, and they learn the company and they learn the ins and outs, what's normal, and then everything will be um, on the up and up, and it, it's going to be a much more pleasant situation for everyone. The business is going to get better security, uh, the SOC is going to keep people around longer, and people are going to enjoy their jobs more. So that's my proposal with this one. Uh, thank you to everyone for this. Uh, if you want to talk with me about this, I'd love to you know, chat with you all later. Uh, so thank you. Great.